Bibles, I invite you to open them to the book of James, chapter 4, chapter 5, verse 7. And we read these words. It says, Be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, under the coming of the Lord, because the husbandman, or the farmer, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Uh, the, that phrase talks really represents the uh, beginning and the ending of the Jewish harvest. Uh, the beginning, the early rain took place in October, and they hoped that that rain would soften prepare the ground that was to be uh, tilled. And then the later rain, which took place in March or April, uh, was to ripen the fruit. And then verse 8, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brothers and sisters, lest ye be contend. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and an example of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure or persevere. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord or the purpose of the Lord in his life that the Lord is very pitiful. In other words, he's a God of much pity. He's a compassionate God and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Father, we thank you for your word which not only is so precious, but is so practical. And you have a practical word and a truthful word for each one of us today. And in the middle of this crowd, I pray that your Holy Spirit might take this truth to each heart and life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we're glad you're here. I've already enjoyed the service. Uh, thank you for it. Uh, I have been under the weather this week, and my voice tells it. Now, I don't have COVID. Uh, I uh, was tested twice this week, and so I, I passed this on to my wife. She doesn't have COVID either, but uh, my voice is just really, uh, I know, somewhat, somewhat scratchy. At that prayer service a few weeks ago, or a, few, a week or so ago, I had a guy come up to me. He said, Pastor Holman... He said, you don't know me, but he said, I remember a time when you could have uh, preached or prayed and spoken to this whole crowd without a microphone. He said, COVID has really done a number on your voice. I said, well, there was a time I could sing, but COVID took away my singing voice. <laughs> so I, I blamed it on COVID. But anyway, I hope I get through this because I think I got something uh, from the Lord as we make our way through the book of James. Now, a couple of people asked me a couple of weeks ago, um, I'll finish James. Now, I don't think I'll do James next week. I think I'm going to do something on Labor Day, I believe. And then the next week after that, I have something I, I really want to share with you from the book of Romans. And then I'm going to start a series on uh, the book of Revelation. Now, I know people think Revelation can be controversial. Honestly, it's not. Because the very first verse really tells us what Revelation is about, and it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what Revelation is about. But I'm going to go through verse by verse. And uh, my great chemistry teacher told me that if I do that, i got to be able to finish it. And uh, there, I have almost 50 messages as we make our way through the book of Revelation, verse by verse. 
chapter by chapter. And, and I really feel the Lord has uh, uh, prepared my own heart. You know, I, Susan and I took our first church in 1974. I was 22 years old. I mean, I was dry behind the ears, buddy. And I walked into a setting. The very first service I preached, a deacon walked up to me and he said, I want you to know that I didn't vote for you and I don't want you here. I thought, okay, this is getting started right, the way I always hoped it would. And uh, I go back and look at some of those sermons and think to myself, well, how'd these folks make it on what I gave them? But after 50 years of, of preaching God's word, and I was really trained to be a topical style preacher, but as the years went on, I really saw the need to, to preach God's word verse by verse. I'm not opposed to anybody that does it differently. It's just the way God has led in my own heart. And I really believe that we can use the book of Revelation to get some visitors in as we give you some truths about Jesus Christ. Took me a while, but I figured out that Revelation is not a book about marks and dragons and, and beasts and seven heads and all that. It's a book about Jesus Christ. And I will plan to do that. As, but now our job is to finish the book of, of James. And uh, what a subject. It's on the subject of patience. And you know what? I've said this. I made this statement. And I've heard other people make this statement. Well, I, I'm not going to pray for patience because I know what, what you've got to go through in order to develop patience. And, and they mean by that, and I meant by that, boy, you've got to go through suffering and difficulty. And that's true, but it's not going through suffering and difficulty that produces patience. It's responding to those things in the right way. And actually, folks, when you stop to think about it, and Terry, you hit the nail right on the head, patience comes from within. Because the development of patience really is the fruit of the Spirit, which is long-suffering. And it's the Lord that helps us develop that. But really, one of the characteristics of patience is waiting. I don't know, was it you, Tommy, that said patience is waiting a long time? Well, he's right. And that's one of the characteristics is waiting. And many of us spend a lot of our life just plain old waiting. You know, when I was little, I could hardly wait to start school. I look so pious, you were the same way. When I got into school, I could hardly wait, you know, to get out. And uh, then I could hardly wait to start driving. My driver instructing teacher was Troy Ingram. Many of you know him. I think some of his family comes here. He told me one time I was the only guy he ever taught to drive where he developed 10 necks. He said, I had to have a, you know, we had one of those stick shifts. And uh, I could hardly wait to start driving. And, and then I could hardly start, wait till I graduated. You know, I'd had enough of chemistry class. I had enough of all that stuff. I could hardly wait till I got out. And then I could hardly wait to get married. And over 51 years ago, uh, Susan and I, uh, we came together at the Grace Baptist Church in Birmingham, Michigan. And uh, we were married. And then I could hardly wait to have kids. And God's given us four kids. One of them he chose to take. And then we could hardly wait to get into our church, our first church. And so it's true, we spend a lot of time waiting. And, and be honest, there's a lot of things in life that test your patience. Isn't that true? I mean, one thing that tests my patience is freeways. <laughs> you ever been on a freeway and it's backed up and you're thinking to yourself, I got an appointment and the traffic is not moving and it's caused by either a, an accident or it's caused by construction. Man, I spent over an hour one day last week uh, on I-70 coming home from Indianapolis just waiting. And, and here's another thing that tests your patience. And we love them, but kids test our patience. 
You know, I remember reading about a guy that was standing on a street corner next to a baby carriage and he was holding his baby in his arms and he was saying, now, George, hold it together, George. Calm down, George. Please, George, quit crying. Please, George, quit yelling. And a kind lady walked up to him thinking he was just keeping his child for a while while his wife was, was doing something. And so she kindly took the little baby out of his arms and she said, now, George, he said, ma'am, that's not George. I'm George. <laughs> Kids test our patience. You know, supermarket lines test our patience. Have you ever noticed that no matter what line you get into, the other line always goes quicker? It's the craziest thing I ever saw. Doctor's office tests our patience. Here's another thing that tests our patience. Irritating people. We hate to wait. We are the now generation. We simply do not like to wait. I find that I am somewhat patient, except when I'm hungry, and then I completely lose my character. You know, you go into a, you go into a restaurant, and I never thought about this, but you know, a uh, person who serves you is either a waitress or a waiter. There's a reason for that, I finally figured out. You gotta wait to get your seat. You gotta wait to get the menu. You gotta wait to order. You gotta wait to get your food. You gotta wait to get your bill. So today we're gonna look at what James has to say about how to develop patience. And you know, one of the things I'm reminded of often is that we need patience in every area of our life. I said earlier, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And in this passage alone, when you read it carefully, you see that the word patience or perseverance, I think in the King James it's endure, is used a total of six times. In verse number seven, he uses it twice. He says in the opening statement, it's a command be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters. And then he uses the illustration of a farmer that has to wait a long time. And then in verse number eight, he uses the word again in the way of a command when he says, be ye patient. And then in verse number 10, he uses it once when he talks about the example of the prophet's patience. And then in verse number 11, he uses it twice. He uses the word perseverance or endure. And then he talks about the patience of, of Job. And then he uses the word wait uh, one time. And waiting is really a characteristic of, of patience. And in my opinion, it's a neglected spiritual discipline. It's an important spiritual discipline. We talk about spiritual disciplines. We talk about uh, reading God's word, that, that quiet time, which is so important. Oh, we talk about prayer. But a spiritual discipline right along with those is learning to wait upon the Lord. By the way, don't you think that's a good message for First Baptist? I know, I know we want a preacher that's better looking than that guy that's standing in this pulpit now. I know we want that preacher that will come in and, and do what needs to be done. And I'm all for that. But don't you think it's far more important to have God's choice than just somebody to fill the pulpit? And part of that process really encourages us and teaches us to wait. And then he uses three illustrations, and I think this is broken down so, so carefully and, and wonderfully for us. In verse number seven, he uses the illustration of the farmer. In the King James, the word that's used is husbandman, but it's really talking about a farmer. 
And then in verse number 10, he uses the illustration of a prophet. And an illustration is nothing more than a window to let the light in. So he wants, us, he wants, us, he wants to teach us something about patience using as an illustration or a picture window the prophet or the farmer. And then in verse number 11, he uses the illustration of, of Job. And so he uses these three illustrations. And from it, I've taken as my outline these three things. When to be patient. Why be patient. And how to be patient. And so we'll break that down this morning. And, and then let's look at the first one. When to be patient. And he gives us three times when we need that extra dose of patience in our life. Here's the first time. Number one, and it's right there in your outline. When circumstances are uncontrollable. Now let me repeat that. At times in your life, I don't care who you are, you've encountered, in circum you've encountered circumstances that are uncontrollable. And by now, you've figured out that a lot of things that's happened to you or a lot of things in your life are beyond your control. You can't keep your thumb on everything. I feel sorry for you control freaks. I feel sorry sometimes for you micromanagers. And he uses the illustration of a farmer as an example of when circumstances are beyond our control. In other words, I think one of the things I could say is don't go into farming unless you got a lot of patience. Part of the job description of being a farmer is you do a lot of waiting. You wait to till. You wait to plant. You wait to prune. You wait to harvest. More than the factor of waiting on things to do are the factors that the farmer has no control over. He has no control over the weather. He has no control over rain, how much it rains, how little it rains. He has no control over the heat. They have no control over drought. They have no control over the economy. They have no control over labor practices. And you and I have a lot of things that happen to us that are beyond our control. A lot of uncontrollable factors or circumstances in your life. But let me tell you something I've learned in my own life. Have you ever noticed that even when a situation is beyond our control... We still try to control it. Now let that sink in. Even when a situation is beyond our control, we still try to control it. How do we do that? By worry. By worry. We think that worry will control a situation. I don't know about you, but here's the conclusion I've come to in my own life because I struggle with this from time to time, to worry about something that you can control is absolutely dumb. To worry about something you can't control is absolutely useless. We need to be patient in uncontrollable circumstances. Number two, we need to be patient when people are unchangeable. Look at verse 10. Take my brothers and sisters, the prophets. He uses the illustration of the prophet. What was the duty of the prophet? Well, of course, it was to proclaim the word of God. It was to do a number of things. But one of the duties of the prophet was to help people change. To bring them back to God and to be different in their behavior. I think I told you this the first week. I can't remember at my age. It's a wonder I remember anything. But I took a job after I retired. 
uh, just a part-time job at a funeral home. And somebody saw me downtown and they said, Holman, Holman, come here, come here. So I walk over to them. They say, got to ask you a question. I said, ask. They said, we don't understand why you left the pulpit to go into the undertaking business. Well, that wasn't entirely true. I was preaching somewhere every Sunday, almost. And I looked at him and I said, listen, Steve. I said, I spent 50 years in the preaching business trying to straighten out guys like you and you never straightened out. Now in the undertaking business, when I straighten guys like you out, you stay straight. <laughs> but the job of the prophet was to help people change. And, and, and have you noticed that people often resist change? I mean, you can make one tiny little suggestion to them and they get defensive and, and they resist what you were saying to them. Let me ask you a question. And this, this shows you how practical James was as under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He gave us this truth. Do you have somebody in your life right now who refuses to change? Maybe a mate. Maybe a son or a daughter. Maybe a grandchild. Maybe even a parent. You already know how difficult it is to live with that person. What is James doing here? He's given, him a, he's given to us a great piece of advice. Have patience with people like that. In fact, they talked about it up here in the children's moment. But do you know what the, the Greek word for patience, and it's used six times here, once as endure or perseverance. That's a different Greek word. But it's used five times here. Do you know what the Greek word for patience that's used five times here means? It's the word mac. Macro thumas. Macro meaning long. And thumas meaning heat. It, we get our word thermometer from that Greek word. It literally means it should take us a long time to get hot. It means we should have a long fuse. It means if we have developed patience, by the way, through the fruit of the Spirit, and that, listen, that's something we're all working on. We don't blow up too quickly. We don't get overheated with people too soon. In fact, as a guy who's been working with people most of my life, I've learned that in order to be successful in working with people, you've got to learn to be patient. You don't get too rude too quickly. You don't get too angry too quickly. You don't get upset too quickly. You don't become unkind too quickly. By the way, we've raised three kids. And I've learned as a parent to be successful. You've got to have a long fuse. You don't get overheated too quickly. And James is saying to us that you and I, in our daily walk, in our daily journey through life, we need to be patient when circumstances are uncontrollable. And buddy, there's not a person here that hasn't had a circumstance or two, or maybe many more, that are out of control. And we got to develop the gift the fruit of patience. And we need to be patient when people are unchangeable. And then there's a third thing here. When problems are unexplainable. Look at verse 11. He gives us the third illustration here. And he gives us an example of Job. Man, I got to tell you something. Job played in the Super Bowl of suffering. I mean, he won the championship. I mean, he was the wealthiest guy of his day. He was the Bill Gates of his day. I certainly hope he was much more conservative 
But he was the Bill Gates of his day. He had everything going for him. And when you go back <coughs> and you read those opening chapters in two days, in just two days, Alice, he lost everything. I mean, he went bankrupt. His kids were taken from him, all ten of them, by a storm. He got an incredible, deadly disease that was extremely painful. You thought you had a rough day? In a two-day period, he lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his friends. He lost his finances. He was suffering mentally, physically, socially, in every kind of way. And, in one, and on one day, his wife comes to him and she says, Job, she says, why don't you just curse God and die? Now that's a real support system. God allowed the devil to take everything from him except a nagging wife. <laughs> Ladies, nothing intended there. <laughs> the worst part of Job's suffering is that he had absolutely no idea what's happening to him. In fact, you go back and you read the first 37 chapters of the book of Job... He, God doesn't even talk to him. God doesn't even tell him why it's happening. There was no apparent reason for his misfortune. Job could truthfully say, why me? Tell you something, life's not fair. That's true. God never said it would be fair. A lot of things in your life and mine just don't make sense. Maybe you and I will never understand them until we get to the other side of glory because now we see through a glass darkly. Job didn't understand. But in spite of all these unexplainable problems, Job maintained his faith. When do we need patience? Well, you and I need patience when circumstances are uncontrollable. You and I need patience when people are unchangeable. You and I need patience when problems are unexplainable. Now, why be patient? He addresses that in these few verses. Here's the first what reason we can be patient. Oh, this is good. Because God is in control. Do you know that three times in this passage, in verse 7... In verse 8 and verse 9, he says, the Lord's coming is near. And someone said, that was written 2,000 years ago. When you break those words down in the book of Revelation, there's a word called shortly. These things shortly must come to pass. When you break those words down, none of those words mean immediately. But what all of those words mean is that when they begin to happen, they're going to happen quickly. Aren't we seeing that happen today? I mean, when things took off, buddy, we're seeing a move quickly. But three times in this chapter, he says the Lord's coming is near. Jesus is coming back. You know what? Listen to this. That's the ultimate proof that God is in control. No, nothing can stop it. The Bible says more about Jesus' second coming when he comes back to judge the world. And in verse 9, it mentions the fact that he's coming back as the judge than it does about his first coming. God is, control, is in control of history. History is nothing more than his story. He's got it all planned out. Everything is on schedule. Nothing, it's late. It's all moving toward his climax. God is in control. And watch this. God's purpose for your life and mine is greater than any problem you're facing right now. God is in control. Look at verse number 8. I want to show you this verse. And I really want to read it to you out of the Phillips translation. In the King James it says, Be also patient, establish or strengthen your hearts, 
For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Let me read it to you in the Phillips translation. The Phillips translation says, Resting your hearts on the ultimate certainty. Though a situation may come up that's out of my control, no circumstance is out of God's control. I tell you, I was reading in my private devotions uh, uh, just a few days ago, Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 says that in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Old Isaiah's world was spinning out of control. His friend, his mentor had just died. And what did he see? He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord setting upon his throne. What was the Lord doing? As Isaiah's world was spinning out of control, as Isaiah's world was in, in chaos, there was the Lord. He wasn't pacing back and forth, wondering what in the world he was going to do. He wasn't pulling out his hair. He wasn't wringing his hands. Isaiah said, in the year that my friend died, in my own world, was out of control, I looked up and I saw the Lord setting upon his throne. And when I read that statement, I think of majestic sovereignty. High and lifted up. With height comes perspective. Old Isaiah didn't, couldn't quite see what was going on. All he could see was the circumstance that his friend and mentor had been taken from him. But when he looked toward his God, there he was, calmly seated upon his throne, high and lifted up. Although I can't control everything that happens in my life, God can. So I just need to learn to trust him. And because God is in control, he's working everything out for his glory and our good. You know what? God's timing is always perfect. Some of you, and at times my own self, we've experienced rain delays. But God's delays never thwart his purposes. God's in control. Here's something else. God rewards patience. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, Behold, we count them happy which endure, which persevere. That word establish means to strengthen or, or to stand, up, or stand upright even in the midst of chaos. God rewards patience. Notice it uses the term happy. Happy throughout the New Testament especially uh, is the word blessed. In fact, notice what he says. He said, ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end. That word end means purpose. The purpose of the, uh, purpose of the Lord in Job's life. Because when you read about Job, the second half of Job's life was more blessed than the first half. Remember, God took 10 of his kids and then God gave them 20 back. I guess that was a blessing. <laughs> 20 kids. Woo. God doubled everything he had. You know what the message there is? It pays to be patient. There are all kinds of rewards. Your character grows. You get along with people better. You're more happy. You reach your goals. There are a lot of benefits of being patient. God rewards it. You're honored by others. They'll say of you, boy, there's a patient person. You know what Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14 say? Blessed are you when men persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. So they persecuted the prophets before you. You need to be patient. I need to be patient. 
because God is in control and God is working things out and he rewards patience. Number three, not only is God in control, not only does God reward patience according to the illustration given here, but God is working things out. God is at work behind the scenes. We may not see it. You know, that child that's testing you. You know, that mate that is testing you. God is behind the scenes working things out. When we don't understand it, when you and I cannot even see it, we need to understand the fact that God is able to do it. And that's what he says there in verse 11, for the second half of it. He have heard of the patience of Job and have now seen the purpose of the Lord. God was at work even though Job did not understand or even though Job did not see what God was doing. A delay does not mean a denial. You and I need to really learn the difference between a no and a not yet. We want what we want now. But we've got to learn to be patient. God was at work even when we don't see what is going on. I was on Facebook this week and I saw a young lady that walked into the church I was pastoring in 2004. She walked in with two other ladies and they sat on about the third or fourth row and I uh, said that morning, I made this statement, I wasn't unkind, I wasn't mean, I, I, honestly, I, I asked the Lord to help me no matter what I say to be kind because Really, it's the word that should be offensive, not the messenger. And I just simply made the statement. I said, I thank God for all the good that uh, AA has done. But there needs to be more than a higher power for people to truly change. That higher power needs to be Jesus Christ. And two of the young ladies, when I said that, they abruptly got up and walked out. And they, from the third row all the way back, and it was obvious that they were unhappy. That third lady stayed. And I finished my preaching and I gave an invitation. And my mother was sitting in that row. And it was obvious that she was under conviction and the tears were rolling down her face. And my mother reached over and said to her, she said, if you want to go pray, I'll go pray with you. And she said, I would like that. And she walked down the aisle, got on her knees. And that morning she became a, one of Jesus Christ's own. And she said to me afterwards, she said, I'm, in a, I'm a student at Earlham College. She said, this is the fifth college that I've gone to. She said, I've just gone in and partied and left and said, my parents have the means to send me wherever I want to go. I've been to the University of Hawaii. I've been here and there. Said, I finally settled at Earlham College. She said, all three of us are in AA. And that morning, buddy, God saved her. And as proof of his salvation, he changed her. And she started, she went through our drug program and she'd come to me and she'd say to me, she'd say, now I want to teach at a Christian school. But she said, I don't really know anything about this. She said, I've been an evolutionist most of my life. And she said, here in Christian schools, they teach the Bible and God is the creator. I said, don't worry about that. You just find where God wants you. I think that's a... I think that's a good thing. And uh, she'd bring me applications and she'd say, now, what's this mean? She'd say, it means here if I teach in this Christian school, I can't do this and I can't do that. 
I'd say, I said to her, I said, Shannon, maybe you ought to stay away from that school. And, and I'd help her. And finally, she ended up at, the, at a Christian school in Knoxville, Tennessee, teaching. And she met a guy who was preparing for the ministry. She ended up marrying him. And she met me in uh, halfway. They called me one day, said, would you meet us? And so I drove to Louisville and met him. And, and uh, the doctor had told her she could never have kids. I said, well, you just let the Lord be the one that makes that decision. Who's the great physician? Shannon, almighty God. I said, you let him determine that. I said, it may be that he wants you to adopt. It may be that he wants you to just spend your life investing it in other people. I can't say, but you just trust God. And she did that. And I saw a picture of her yesterday on Facebook with three beautiful looking kids. The doctors had said, there's no hope. And you know what? Maybe there wasn't. And I said to her, don't worry about it. God will have something even better for you if you just look to him. But as I stood there yesterday and looked at that Facebook picture, I thought, it pays to wait. I'm the only one worth waiting on. And that's a sovereign God. We want what we want now, but God says, learn to be patient. I'm working things out. And while I am waiting, God is working. Your hands may be tied and the situation may be uncontrollable to you. But that situation is not uncontrollable to God. And in advance, thank God because he's working things out. Philippians 2.13 says that God is at work in you. Maybe you and I can't see it, but he is. Romans 8.28 says all things work together for good. doesn't say it'll all be good, but he says it'll all work together for good. God is at work. I don't know what it is. Could it be a financial problem right now in your life that you need God to work it out for you? Could it be a relationship problem? Could it be a health issue? Be patient and trust him. And lastly, think about this. How am I to wait? James gives us three illustrations to help us to see what we're to do while we are waiting. Number one, wait expectantly. In verse 7, notice he uses the illustration of the farmer. In my own life, as I wait, I must expect a harvest. I must believe that it is inevitable. What does a farmer do while he's waiting on God? Just sit and watch reruns of the Beverly Hillbillies on television all day? <laughs> while he's waiting on the harvest, the farmer is preparing for the answer. He's getting ready. Waiting is a time of preparation which shows your expectation. We demonstrate our expectation by our preparation. We get ready for the answer in advance. What are you waiting for from God? Maybe to heal a long-term illness maybe to transform your marriage, maybe to reverse your financial problems, maybe to reach your kids for Christ. What are you doing to get ready for it? The way you get ready for something is by preparing in advance. Praying, demonst preparing demonstrates expectation. A lot of times while I'm waiting on God, he's really waiting on me. He's ready to give me an answer, but I'm not ready to receive it. He's saying, Holman, Roberts, Doyle, Clark, 
Skip, Brushers, Tracy, Shannon. He's saying, grow up. He's saying, get some spiritual depth in your life. I want to bless your life, but right now, you wouldn't be able to handle it. What I want for you, Holman, is absolutely awesome, but you're such a puny pipsqueak spiritually. Grow up. Waiting is a time to get ready. Wait expectantly. Number two, wait quietly. James knew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that when you and I get irritated, we have a tendency to run off at the mouth. Look at verse 9. He warns us about two things here. In verse 9, here, he, he warns us uh, about uh, grumbling against each other. Verse 9. Grudge not one against another, brethren. I thought, why in the world does he talk about grumbling in the middle of a, of a script on patience? It's hard to be quiet when you're frustrated. When you get frustrated, I don't know about you, but I want the whole world to know it. You know what else it says to me? Don't blame your troubles on other people. When you get up in the morning, do you rise and shine or do you rise and whine? Do you hit the ground griping, everything is bad? If you come home at night dog tired, it could be because you've growled all day. So he says, don't grumble against one another, even when you're frustrated, even when you're waiting. Then look at it, look at something else he says and I used to wonder what in the world he put this thing in here for he says verse 12 but of all things my brethren swear not now be honest does waiting ever tempt you to swear <laughs> I don't believe in cussing but there are times when I'm frustrated if Aaron would write it out I'd sign it He'd say, listen, boy, when you get frustrated, don't grumble against one another. And I know there's another application here, but I'm going to give it this application because it's so practical. Does waiting on God become difficult? Absolutely. It's a spiritual discipline. But we're told to wait expectantly. We're told to wait quietly. God is at work. He's in control of all, all things. And lastly, wait confidently. Verse 11. He gives us the illustration of Job. You go back and you read Job. Man, he was under attack. There were some problems that were absolutely unexplainable that took place in his life. And yet, here's what it says in Job chapter 1, verse 22. In all this, Job sinned not. In Job chapter 13, verse 15, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. He said in chapter 19, verse 25, Even in the middle of all this, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know he's alive. I know that he's real. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Wait confidently. Because trusting God gives us hope. H-O-P-E. You know what hope is? Hope is holding on, praying expectantly. I got a friend. In fact, this church... First Baptist was kind enough to let he and his wife stay in your beautiful, wonderful mission house, mission apartment. When we got out of college, we went to seminary together, and I re recognized that he was a one talented guy, but that his personality got in the way. He had a bombastic personality. And first time I met him, he was on top of another seminary student, beating him half to death. I had to pull him off, that guy. He graduated from seminary, and 
He took a church in northern Michigan and a few years later he took a church in the Upper Peninsula. And then he called me one day and said, I'm going to go out and start a church in Seattle, Washington. I said, you're going to go that far? I said, Jack, you think you got God's will on that? And he said, I know I do. I said, okay. He went out there. He stayed a couple of years. Came back to the Detroit area, pastored at the First Baptist Church in Garden City, Michigan. And then he ended up in Paris, Illinois, where he's been for 35 years. And in October, he, they had three kids. They were married the same week Susan and I uh, was married. They had three kids the same ages as ours, our first one the Lord decided to bring home. But had three kids, the same ages as our kids. And I was working with an evangelistic ministry. My office was in Tucson, Arizona, and the phone rang. And it was Jack, and he was crying. I said, Jack, what's wrong? He said, Marty, he said, our son Matthew, 13 years old, same age as our youngest, said he's had the flu all week. Said we took him to the doctor and kept him out of school and did what we were supposed to do. And said last night late, he started to hyperventilate. He said, you know, he said, we live right across the, the field from the hospital and he said, we didn't wait for the ambulance. I stuck him in my car. And as fast as I could, I got him to the, to the hospital, just on the other side of the field from us. And said, when I got him into the emergency room, he'd passed away. He said, God took our, our boy. I don't know why. I said, I can't answer that. But I saw God take that life and transform that life and through the death of his son God used him in that community I mean it's a city of 6,000 people and he never built a big church but God took that experience in his life and instead of them getting bitter he got better and God used him in that city and I would go there for different things and I'd be amazed at the influence that he had the lives he touched the people that were changed because God was at work in his life and a couple of years ago, Susan and I drove and I had part in his 50th anniversary celebration. And he took me aside. He said, you know, he said, I've struggled so bad here as far as our church goes. But he said, because of Matthew's death, God has given me incredible influence. But he said, you know, I've struggled as, a, as, a, as this church has struggled. And he said, I really haven't been paid in 10 years. He said, I've stuck on because uh, Jill has worked. And we could do it. And he said, my boy has served as my assistant and we've paid him. But then the pandemic just did a number. And the hospital came along and said, we want to buy your property. And the 20 members that were there came together and said to him, Pastor Hoffman, you have been such an incredible testimony in this community. And you've stuck it out here when other people wouldn't have. And you've had opportunities to leave, but you've never felt the mind of the Lord. And you've just stuck it out. We want you to sell this property to that hospital. And we want to do it right. We want to give the money to our missionaries and to others. But we want to return all the money that we owe to you. And he'll call me up. He called me this week and he said, hey, we were able to help this missionary in Argentina. We were able to buy him a brand new car. And our people are so excited and so thrilled and They've been able to take care of me. I hung up and I thought, God honors faithfulness. And when you have a problem that is unexplainable, 
or you have a person that is unchangeable, or you have a circumstance that is uncontrollable, then wait. Wait expectantly. Wait quietly. Wait confidently, knowing that God is at work. Stand with me, please. As you reflect on what's said this morning, the altar's open for anyone that wants to come and pray. I'll stand here at the front. But as we sing and reflect on this, ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what do I need to take out of here for my life, for my journey, for my walk? And today, if you need to respond, just to pray, feel free to do so. If you need to say, you know, I saw that young lady baptized last week. I need to do that. You can come and respond. If you say, hey, I've been coming here and I need to join. Boy, you can do that as well. Someone will help you, I promise. But let's sing together as we sing this song as Aaron leads us.